Welcome to DNA Welcome. Live from the kiosk. So, of course, a couple of weeks ago we were in Toronto. Last week we, well, I'm, I, we we just put a little extra segment in because we were traveling. So we're finally back at the kiosk. You know, we got Father Tim back, and as per usual, Father Tim, if you could open us up yes. in prayer. Absolutely. In the, name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we ask you send your your blessing down upon us this day as we prepare ourselves to uh, have the show to send out to the world, to your people, wherever they may be, especially during this month of the Most Holy Rosary, which we celebrate for the month of October. Uh, and we ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, and through our Lady Queen of the Most Holy Rosary. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. You Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And that was a great segue. It is the month of the Holy Rosary. Yes. Why don't we start off with a promise right away? Oh, yes, yes. That'd be the great. 15 promises that we get from the Blessed Virgin Mary for those of us who pray the Rosary. Number one, who, whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the Rosary shall receive signal graces. We have 15 of those, so we'll do some more of those as the month goes on. That's awesome. So last week, October 7th, of course, was the Feast of the Holy Rosary. And coast to coast, I mean, there was events everywhere. And we yes. were blessed to host one here. And the people that were here actually got to hear a couple of pretty amazing announcements that we made. So we're, we're going to make them to you as well. And hopefully some of you will be able to join us. So we spoke about the fact that next year's pilgrimage is really falling into place. We've got it happening between August 21st and August 25th. So two days are is actually going to be here in Ottawa because we're really trying to establish Ottawa as, as a place of pilgrimage. Yes. I mean, the 1947 yes. Congress took place here. And now, of course, we have the pilgrim statue of Our Lady the Cape installed here at Blessed Sacrament. Now, the big news was, of <laughs> course, two weeks ago, you saw that we had Father Roger on. And he has confirmed that he'll be actually conducting healing rosaries oh. at the pilgrimage next year, which is going to be awesome. Awesome. So both at the Cape and in Ottawa. But we didn't end there. We had one other piece of news that just kind of came in last Monday, which we're super, super uh, excited about. And that is, and maybe we'll back up. Uh, you've often heard us talk about the confraternity of the Most Holy Rosary. And of course, it was given to the Dominican order uh, in order to establish confraternities. Now, the mother house of the Dominican order order is Santa Sabina in Rome. And that's where if you visit there, you will actually see St. Dominic's cell. Father Tim, oh. you were there yes. uh, and you've experienced that. So the promoter general of the rosary for basically planet Earth, his name is Father Chris Eggleton. And Father Chris has confirmed with us last Monday that he'll be coming to Blessed Sacrament December 7th and 8th and we'll be conducting, I guess it'll be an advent, but a rosary mission, which is awesome. Very exciting, very yeah, exciting. So we, we know that that's gonna be an event that's gonna be well attended, and we'd love to have you with us if you can. Especially if you're living outside of town anywhere, you can bring some bus loads, let's pack the church. Amen. So today we have a mother and daughter duo, yeah. which is really neat. It's and, great. And the cool story about them is, of course, uh, they come from uh, Cornwall originally. And actually, uh, the mother, Heidi Kroll, is the one who actually organized the pilgrimage here in the summer, which was just awesome. So I think I'm going to be interviewing her first. Yes, and then uh, you'll be interviewing Maria. Yes, so, we'll see you all later. Without further ado, come on up. Uh, Heidi. Welcome to DNA Live. It's wonderful to have you here with us. How are you? Very good. Thank good. you very much. Well, God bless you. Thank you. And you know, it's amazing how the Lord works because I was kind of hungry before the show. And look at that. She comes in with this great, what was that thing called? It was called Nuskipel. Nuska who? Nuskipel. It's a German, okay. it's a Swiss or German dessert. It has nuts, wow. nuts on the inside. And 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 obviously some sweeteners and stuff because I'm feeling pretty uh pretty You're feeling good. Right now. Yeah, I'm feeling yeah. good. This is good. So <laughs> <laughs> so all right. So your your background, as I understand, I mean you weren't you weren't born and raised in, in Ottawa. Why don't you tell our viewers uh, where your heritage is from? Where'd you come from? So I was born in Switzerland uh in a little town called Hnonau, which is part of the canton of Zurich. Um, I was, uh, my parents were farmers there. Mm. My uh, dad's farm, though, didn't belong to him. 
it was a pacht, which means it's kind of a rented property. And uh, when I was seven years old, my dad decided that he would come to Canada and see for a bigger fortune to own his own farm. Uh, so my dad came here, really liked it, worked here for two uh, then after he got here, he uh, asked my mom to sell the rest of the things we had and move over. We were four children at that time. I was the oldest. Mm. And uh, yeah, my dad worked for two years for other farmers here and then uh, moved to Eastern Ontario and bought a farm. So and what kind of a farm would that have been? Uh, so my parents have a dairy farm. Wow. Yeah. And so now my, uh, my two brothers, two of my brothers and uh, some of my uh, nephews are running that dairy farm. So you came to Canada, I guess, I think you shared with me, it was around 1969, is that yes, right? Yes, I was seven years old. That's seven right. <laughs> years old in 69. So, um, and you didn't speak English at the time. No, didn't speak English. Uh, my parents didn't speak English either. Uh, really, they learned their English through us. Uh, we wow. went to school. Uh, one of the funny stories that happened is... Um, I guess in Switzerland, we were still going to school uh, barefoot and wearing our aprons. So one of the notes my mother got <laughs> after we came home was that we didn't need to wear our aprons, but we definitely needed shoes. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. Isn't so. that something? So I, I take it this was a Catholic household right from the get-go? That's or? right. My parents yeah. uh, were, are both Catholic. And uh, so, yes, we, uh, we d went to church, practiced our faith. And yeah, when we moved down here, uh, my parents then sent us to a Catholic school, mm -hmm. Iona Academy uh, in Glengarry County, which is actually right near in the town of St. Rapples, which is the beginning of uh, really the uh, Catholic faith in uh, Ontario. Oh, I didn't so, know that. Uh, yeah, St. Rapples was right under the, I don't know if it was called the Archbishop at the time from Quebec City. Oh, uh, so interesting. So it's a Scottish area. Right. And uh, yeah. Uh, has a beautiful church there, beautiful big church that actually burnt the year after we moved here. Uh, mm. St. Raffles burnt to the ground one night. It uh, was very unfortunate. I don't really remember it mm -hmm. except for the pictures. Uh, so I grew up there. Uh, when I was 18, I went back to Switzerland, studied cooking uh, in Mensingen with the Mensingen sisters um, and uh, really enjoyed that. Came back, met... Uh, and married my husband, uh, who also has a dairy farm. And uh, there uh, we have an, now we have an organic dairy farm. And uh, there we raised our nine children. Nine children. That's right. My. <laughs> and running a farm. That's right. <laughs> and what did you do in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no, it I was. I can't uh, imagine. That's it amazing. It was a real blessing for mm. us to live on a farm. And, uh, course to have nine children mm -hmm. uh, so we have six six boys and uh, everyone had to help on the farm is a really right. that was very good farms are, are good to have children learn to work and to be working with their parents so that was you know from feeding calves to helping with all kinds of other chores, rock picking and whatever, those wonderful jobs on the farms. <laughs> such, such a different life than most of us, I think, would relate to. I, I just, I just, so up obviously really early and like, what, what does the course of a day look like when you're, you got nine children and you're running a farm? Uh, just a quick Well, usually, over. usually in the morning, uh, we go out and start milking around six. Right. And then you'd be in back in the house of about eight o'clock or so, have breakfast, uh, then there's all kinds of morning chores outside, depending whether it's the summer or not. In the summer, you'd be making hay. In the mm. spring, you'd be planting. In the winter, there's just more inside chores because the cows stay in. So there'd be a lot more feeding out, uh, cleaning manure and things like that. Mm. Um, of course, there's uh, repairs and things to do. And uh, yeah. So how did you fit in schooling? How did that all so, work? So uh, pretty on, early on, uh, my husband and I decided that we were going to homeschool our children. We were quite concerned with making sure that they got a good Catholic education. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of it was just uh, learning to read and write the basics, of course. Uh, definitely trying to go to Mass as often as we could. Right. And uh, at one point, some of our children then went to the, off to a couple of uh, private schools uh, run by the Legionaries of Christ, hmm. which had um, moved into our area in the 90s. They had started an novitiate there. And um, yeah, so they have apostolic schools. 
So some of our boys went there and they also then had girl, uh, school for girls in Rhode Island. So that was, it was, what was nice about that is we had the opportunity to travel to some places that we would never have gone to. Right, right. <laughs> so when you've got nine children and you're Catholic, I guess you're probably thinking, like, how does the whole vocation element, I guess, work into that dynamic? So uh, my, I have an aunt, my mother's sister. She's a, a religious in Switzerland, a cloistered nun. Right. My husband uh, comes actually from a family uh, that has uh, vocations that were missionary priests. So he has three uncles, two of which ended up being missionary priests, one in Papua New Guinea and one in uh, Indonesia. Wow. And uh, so really vocations in our, our family and our extended family have been there. So that's, that's really been wonderful. So I think as a Catholic mom, it's, it's always been a joy to be able to talk to my children that to be open to a vocation, whatever that might be, whether it's a religious life or, or married life. And, uh, I was, as I was sharing with you earlier, we have, uh, two of our sons are, uh, one is in his second year of novitiate. And Legionaries of Christ in Cheshire, Connecticut. And then our youngest son just this summer decided to go to an apostolic school in uh, Indiana, Rolling Prairie, Indiana, where uh, he's discerning a vocation to the priesthood as well. Oh, wonderful. So, but it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a grace from God, right? Yeah. It's a, a gift from God. And I think what's important is to be open to that. Right. You know, even with everything that's going on in the church, uh, you know, it's a gift that's been given to your child. It's a calling. And uh, yes. no matter what, as parents, we really need to be open to that and help them foster that because they've been called at this time. So what's it like when you have a son or a daughter, you know, and they say, mm, I'm thinking about, let's say, the priesthood. I mean, what, what goes <laughs> on inside? <laughs> well, for me, uh, yeah. for me, one of the big things is, you know, that I, I really want them to be a good holy priest. Right. So that's that's what I, I pray that, uh, of course, I'm excited. But then at the same time, when you look at the world, you're worried. You yeah, know, what, what is yeah. their life going to be like? You don't stop being a mother. No, well. no. And I, I mentioned that to my son, Christopher. And he says, Mom, you know what? There'd be nothing greater than being a martyr for the church. Wow. So when you hear them say that, you wow. know, you have to you have to think, wow. That, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That so, really is amazing. So uh, I understand you're also involved in some apostolic, I mean, you already have a little set of apostles there, but I mean, uh, some other <laughs> outside apostolic work as well that, that yeah. you've gotten into over the years. Why don't you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as we were talking a little bit earlier, I, I mentioned to you uh, that uh, I'd become a member of Regnum Christi. Right. And our charism is to do uh, the apostolate and is to do things to help uh, grow things in your church and in your community. So um, some of us from Regnum Christi in the Cornwall area, a couple of us women a few years ago, started uh, offering Bible studies to women. Beautiful. So we use uh, materials from Ascension Press. And right now, actually, we're using a, a Bible study from Dynamic Catholic. Good. Uh, it's a study on John. And it, it's wonderful. Excellent. And it's wonderful to be able to uh, offer that to women for them to help fostered their relationship with the Lord. Right. So, and then one of the other things that we felt called to do was um, we started a first Saturday uh, women's morning. And that's how we met you originally. Right. <laughs> right. So what we do is we, on the first Saturday uh, from September to June, we have mass, uh, we have a guest, we have refreshments and we have social time. Uh, we also offer confession. And uh, in the end of the morning, we say the rosary together Beautiful. as the women. And uh, that's really been growing. And uh, I feel that women in general are looking for um, a time to be together to express their faith with other like-minded women. Mm. And the topics vary, you know, from Our Lady, right. like when you came. Uh, this just last Saturday, we had a, uh, a lady from the Cornwall area come talk to us about icons Oh. and how she's been called to paint icons and uh, 
the meaning of icons, how they're used uh, to call you to prayer. Right. And, Is there anything uh, that you remember from that talk? Oh, my of? goodness. Just, she, she talked about the colors and what it symbolized, how the hands. Uh, oh, she talked about how usually the ears are big. Right. And the mouth is small and the eyes are big. So listen more than you talk. <laughs> right. So that was wonderful. It was uh, anyway, it was it was really, really well received and well done. And she had oh, about 10 beautiful icons that she had painted herself that she had brought. Yeah. So she really feels called to that ministry. Now, I've yeah. heard that there's there's I mean, even before someone can start painting icons, uh, there's this. You know, you have to pray for a number of years. Did she talk about that at um, all? Or? Yeah, so she did talk about how um, you're called to prayer. You're called to read scripture. She prays a lot just to even know what to paint. Right. I mean, there are certain icons. She says the story's already told uh, because it's in the Bible. Right. But it's to bring it out in a visual way. Mm. So she prays. She fasts. Of course, she thinks a lot about She draws uh, sketches. Wow and makes like all the details of it, how, and all the, like the folds have to be a certain way and the shadows and it's, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot, one of the lot things, more to it. One anything. of the things that Maureen shared with us is that when she doesn't know, she uh, speaks to someone who's a, a master icon mm. iconographer right. in Montreal. Beautiful. And she'll go and ask him how it should wow. be, so. Yeah. So uh, ministry, like what are you super passionate about as it relates to? What am I super passionate about? <laughs> oh, I'm super passionate about getting people to know the Lord, mm. finding out, uh, you know, how they can serve him, how they can grow closer to him, right. that he's there uh, loving them right. and calling them to look at him, mm. not at themselves, right. but at him and his glory and his beauty and what he has to offer. Right. And then realizing that he loves them just how they are. He's right. calling them to change, of course, but he right. loves them how they are. And that by worshiping and adoring him, they will slowly change. So how, because how he can't do you, change. Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> so how do you live that out in your own life? You in know, my own day, life? With all your busyness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like to have and try to have a, a steady prayer life. So in the morning, I have my morning devotions. Right. Uh, as often as I can, go to daily mass. Right. And uh, we always pray the rosary in our house at home. So Excellent. as a family, for anyone who's home and wants to join us yeah. every night, my husband and I and the rest of the family members that are there, uh, right. we pray the rosary. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Heidi. That was, that was great. Really appreciate you taking thank the you time to do that. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> and now we're going to look forward to hearing from one of your daughters. This is yeah, going to be right. great. So invite uh, Angelina and Maria to come forward. All right. God bless you. Here we go, sweetheart. Come on over, Maria. What a beautiful name she has, eh, Maria? So we're blessed to have one of the nine beautiful children here with us on the show today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we've been hearing about how your parents encouraged all of you about the vocation that you might be venturing out into, whether the consecrated single life or the married life. And as we were talking earlier, it sounded like you started pretty early with those thoughts of what was going to happen at the age of 13. Where did you venture off to then? Right. Yeah. So when I was uh, 13 years old, I went to a boarding school in Rhode Island. And that oh was a Catholic God. girls boarding school, basically geared up being a good academic institution. And then at the same time, if you had thoughts towards uh, a vocation, consecrated life, it was gonna foster that as well. So I only ended up staying two years, but I met a lot of, a lot of really great, mostly American young girls there. Um, and the really interesting thing is, you know, I've tried to keep in touch with them over the years, but obviously geography is, well, it's a factor. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, but two years ago, I went to the World Youth Day in uh, Krakow. Oh, nice. And at the end of a World Youth Day, what happens is everyone basically takes this long walk out to a nearby field or park of some kind that can accommodate all the people. And there were over a million of us. So you can imagine that's quite the crowd. And what happened was, you know, on your World Youth Day ticket in a sense you have your own section assigned to you maybe a thousand people here or however they did it so i had a specific place to be i went with the group from canada that i that i'd attended world youth day with set up my sleeping bag 
And I turned around and one of my friends from boarding school was there and she's a nun now. She's, <laughs> oh, from, uh, <laughs> she's from Louisiana and now she's a nun. Oh, and we God. ended up, yeah, getting to talk and, and sleep right beside each other, right under the stars all night, just our sleeping bags out in a field in Poland. <laughs> Over a million people. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Where was this again? 13 years old. And where was that? So that was in Rhode Island. Do they still have that? It doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't now. exist anymore. No, it was already quite small at the time. And, and they discerned that it wasn't, I think, maybe the most fruitful or the best option at the end. But while I was there, it was a good experience. It sounds amazing. Yeah. yeah. So as you continue all this traveling, you're gonna venture now into another big pilgrimage that you just went on. And we're gonna go into more detail about this particular one because maybe some of you watching have been on it or desire to go. We're gonna find out more about it. Tell us. Right, so as we were talking before, I was saying <laughs> it's kind of funny that when I went to World Youth Day, I was able to reconnect with a friend from that school. Yes. And I mean, there were less than 100 of us there. It's a very small school. Um, but Amazing. when I went to Spain, I was able to connect again with two of my former classmates who did go on to become consecrated young women. And they're now uh, stationed in Madrid. So I was able to connect with them. And that was really special as well, just after having walked the Camino to be able to to share a day with them in Madrid before I flew back. Okay, here we go. It's the Camino. That's what we're going to go it's into. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How did you find out about it? What put you and you ended up going on your own. Yep. This is amazing on your own. Maybe the impact of growing up with nine children helped that out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't remember exactly the first time I heard about it. I'm just recalling that. I mean, a bishop. Uh, from our diocese when I was quite young, went on the Camino and talked about it um, in a presentation that just came to mind. But I don't know, the, the genesis of it, I'm not 100% sure, but I wanted to go for quite a while. Oh. And for quite a while, I, I had the impression that it's not really something I could go and do on my own. Like you need, you need to go with somebody or a group or something. Yes. <laughs> um, but I'd still been thinking about going. And just within the past year, I met a few people who had gone on their own, young women as well. And, and they encouraged me and said, no, it's very safe. You're going to meet a lot of people. It's completely doable. So that prompted me that after six years of university, my head could take a break and my legs could do some of the work instead. So yeah, when I, when I finished my last classes, a few days later, my bags were packed and I was on a flight to Madrid. That's pretty quick. So six yeah. years of university, and what did you go through for? Yeah, so I did psychology and then counseling. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, and now you're going to embark on the unknown. Yeah, exactly. So the Camino was a great uh, break after from all of the mental work to just say, you know what, you don't need to make decisions for a while. So um, I walked for four weeks and basically every day it was just you're going to wake up and you know what you're doing, which is keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the places that tell us about the first of all, how did you prepare? Not a lot of preparation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I made sure to get good equipment when I prepped. Good, good, uh, good. And at the same time, I think a lot of the blogs that I read said you should do a lot of walking prep beforehand, but I just didn't have the time because I was writing all my papers. So I didn't, and it turned out okay. I just got some blisters. <laughs> okay, the blisters, but it was <laughs> worth it. Okay, it was worth it. Yeah, so in general, I think if you can prep, that's good. Okay. But it'll work out. It'll work out anyway. So It'll if you feel calls, go specifically, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And basically, I mean, every day, it's very much up to you how far you want to go. I mean, I met some people who would walk 10 to 15 kilometers a day, which isn't very much considering the, the bigger distance. And I met some people who walked 50, which is wow, mind boggling. <laughs> that is mind boggling. Yeah. But basically, yeah, you, you walk and then every day, um, all the towns that you pass through, almost all of them have have special places to stay called albergues. Mm. It's just a Spanish word for a hostel, I guess. And um, basically, as a pilgrim, you carry a special pilgrim's passport, which says, I can stay here, that I'm, I'm actually walking the Camino. It's for real, I'm not just a tourist. Huh? And so there, there's all sorts of them. Some of them are more fancy or pricey, but a lot of them are very basic. And I had some really good experiences in some of those very humble, rudimentary ones. Oh, let's talk about them. Yeah. So. I think it was the second night um, I happened to end up in one. It's right on the side of a church. After the end of a long day of walking, you end up going up like eight flights of stairs to get to the top. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Which didn't feel the greatest at the time, but it was so worth it. <laughs> and basically, you get to the top, and it was all by donation. 
it's just give what you can. If you can't give, don't worry about it. If you need to take out of the box to pay for your lunch the next day, go ahead. Oh. It's really the spirit of the pilgrimage and everyone gets together, cooks a meal together. So maybe you're 30 people, maybe you're 100, maybe it's 10. It just depends on the night. And then you eat together. And, and what the really cool thing is afterwards is everyone's invited to go into the balcony at the back of the church to pray together. And it, there's no obligation. It's just if you want. And most of the people on the Camino that I met weren't religious at all. Very few seemed to have an active religious or spiritual life, but a lot of them definitely seemed to be searching and they got a lot out of these times of prayer. And it was a very emotional moment for a lot of them to say prayers in their own language, mm. to share what's going on in their own hearts or what they're praying for. And they would do, they would have you all sit down. There's something about candles. How does oh, that, yeah, how do they, how sorry. They, no, that's okay. How do they so them? on the first night, uh, yeah, when we were staying in the church, everyone was sitting in the back and they turned off the lights and they just had candles oh. and each person was given the chance to share. So there was one larger candle that was passed around. And as you held it, whether you wanted to share in a more sort of common language like English or just in your own mother tongue, whatever's <laughs> going on for you. And a lot of people found it quite emotional and, and really special. There was something, there was something more going on. That is so special. So that was really cool. And there were a number of places I stayed at like that. Um, another one, the variant that they had was after you prayed, they had a little box absolutely full of intentions that former pilgrims had left. And they were read in, in their own language and really heartbreaking things in a lot of ways that people had been walking for, really big life events that you were able to pray for. And as you left the next morning, you could leave your own intention if you felt that you wanted to as well. And just really impressed upon all of the pilgrims, the fact that, you know, the generosity of yesterday's pilgrim and giving their donation paid for your dinner tonight or the, the attention they left you pray for tonight and the things that you leave the pilgrim of tomorrow is going to benefit from and they're going to pray from. Just a, a real cycle of giving and receiving. That is so special. That, just yeah. that whole concept. I can see how that can be beautiful, bringing that into even other types of things, even in parishes or even in prayer groups. Or That's just so pilgrimages. That's just so beautiful. And did you read these intentions out loud that the other people could also hear what this person was leaving behind? Mm -hmm. And just so, to be able to take that soul into your heart and mind. Yeah, yeah really. And to realize that, you know, sometimes it feels very lighthearted to be walking along kind of, we're all in this together and you can go up and easily meet someone. And it's, it can feel very light in some ways, right? It's very easy to stay at kind of a, a surface level chat, but reading those intentions to realize there are a lot of people walking along this ancient pathway with a very, you know, heavy heart or a very heavy past that they're really working through. And you never really know quite what's on someone, someone's past or their mind. And what is it about the Camino? Can you tell us about the actual Camino itself? Yeah, you know, a little sort bit of about the history. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Camino de Santiago. Santiago is the Spanish word uh, for Saint James. So okay. the whole point of the Camino is it's this ancient pilgrim route. It's over a thousand years old, and you're walking from various points in Europe, mostly starting, you know, somewhere close to Spain or in Spain. And you're walking to a city near the uh, western coast called Santiago de Compostela. It sounds so, so good. Didn't she sound good? <laughs> I have really got this language on. <laughs> so what it means, Santiago is St. James. Okay. And you're walking towards the cathedral where his ruins, his, uh, his body, his bones, I guess, are, have been found okay. historically. That's the, the legend that they've been found there. And they've, the cathedral's been built up. And a lot of pilgrims, especially from Spain in the Middle Ages, wanted to go to St. James. Um, so they've started these pilgrim routes. Why? Yeah. That's amazing. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Now there was another spot just before the end here. You have something in your journal to show us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I kept a journal the whole time I walked and I would, I would write down every day what I did. And sometimes we got little things uh, from places we stayed. So there was another place about halfway along um, and it was run by nuns in a town oh, called uh, Carriando Las Condes. So these <laughs> nuns, basically every day they take people in, over a hundred people, um, and they play music with you. Everyone sings together if you want. And then in the evening, there's a mass that you can go to. And uh -huh. because I more or less can speak Spanish, I often got nabbed into the role of a translator. <laughs> oh, nice, so, nice, nice. 
<laughs> so at the end of the mass, they say, everyone come forward. I'm kind of point out, Maria, you got to come up here, right beside the priest with the microphone. OK. <laughs> and so they gave everyone these beautiful little stars that they'd uh, made and decorated. You can see that, yeah. So each pilgrim gets one. And the nuns gave a really, really beautiful reflection that I, I had the chance to translate about how in life, and especially as a pilgrim, mm -hmm. it's easy to, whether realistically or metaphorically, be focused on the dirt, kind of on the ground, as we're plodding along, in a sense, to feel the heaviness of it, oh. to just see the, yeah, the soil. And they said, you need to look for the little stars. You need to look up. To have hope, you can't focus on the ground. You've got to raise your head higher. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting, because I wasn't making this up. I hadn't made these stars and given them out. I was really just translating as close as I could word for word what they were saying. Um, but the next day, as I was walking along my way, a lot of pilgrims that I was passing by or who were passing me stopped and said, you're the translator. Hey, I really liked what you said. That was so beautiful. That was one of the things that touched me the most. And I was like, oh, <laughs> OK, well, thanks a lot. But it was really interesting just to think about how, you know, even though I hadn't made anything up, and all I contributed was just changing the words from one language to another, a lot of people got something out of that. And just to recognize that I don't need to make things up. I don't need to have this great, huge message. I can just be the middleman, and that can be enough. Obviously touched a lot of lives doing that. Yeah, it was really interesting. It was very cool. When we had our conversation a little bit earlier, it reminded me of, this is amazing, we did a Hail Mary together, and then after that, it came popped into my head on the Daily Missile for today. We've got a quote here from Henry Nguyen, and it says, the real enemies of our life are the oughts and the ifs. They pull us backward into the unalterable past and forward into the unpredictable future. But real life takes place in the here and now. You were talking about this whole Camino, you had expectations, but what happened about you coming together with the here and now? Right, yeah, so as I shared with you before, it's, I mean, you walk for four weeks, you can build up some expectations in your head <laughs> yes, about yes. what is it going to be like when I get there, yes. and especially meeting other pilgrims along the way who have done the Camino before and saying, my whole life was changed by this, and arriving at the cathedral, I burst into tears, or <laughs> really dramatic things, and I was like, okay, better prepare myself for this, like... Yes going to be massive <laughs> and I remember the morning walking into the city and getting to the cathedral and it was nice but it just kind of felt like okay I guess I stopped walking now like I'm here it didn't really feel very big and I was kind of disappointed by the fact that I don't know I wasn't crying I guess. <laughs> um, so it was it was just very different from what I was expecting and that was a little strange for me and I, I had basically arranged that I would have a few days in the city of Compostela to just rest and kind of give my legs a break. And so I had a lot of time where, you know, I would just be in my little rented room in the evening and thinking about, okay, what's going on here that I don't feel like I got a huge thing out of it. Yes. And then I realized as I started connecting with some people who I'd walked along the Camino with, that they'd all had pretty similar experiences, that they'd arrived, and it was fine, but it just wasn't the big thing they thought it would be. Yes. So a lot of us got together, and we, we shared a meal, and we were talking about how we were figuring, you know what, maybe there is more to it, and at the same time, maybe it's not that big moment, but over time, you know, maybe the months, the years after, you're going to start recognizing a lot more. And so one of the evenings that I was just staying in this old seminary that's now been converted into... Um, like a hostel. Wow. I had a room to myself, um, <laughs> finally after four weeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, um, so I, I pulled out a piece of paper and I thought, maybe there is, maybe there are some things I've gained. Maybe something has changed. And I thought, why don't I start trying to see if something comes up? Yeah. And I, I broke for so long. So many things kept coming up. And a lot of the things, like the quote that you just read, were about taking things in the moment and appreciating them and, and making the most in the moment of something, you know, maybe meeting a person or enjoying the town you're in or the meal you're eating that day. And, and, you know, being appreciative, thanking God, and at the same time, just letting it go again and recognizing that not everything has to become something more. Maybe that was it and that was okay. Um, so that was a really big one. And also recognizing that, that you need to go a little more with your gut sometimes. You know, it's easy to go through life 
kind of pushing things off or thinking you'll have good opportunities later for things that you want to do now. And the Camino really helped to teach me sometimes in profound ways and sometimes in simple ones that go with what you're feeling now, you know, whether it's stopping to take that beautiful photo or not uh. passing up the washroom <laughs> or whatever it might be, but you never know when the next thing is going to come along. So why would you pass up the perfect opportunity that's right in front of you just because you don't want to stop? So there were a lot of things that came and some of them more personal than others, but in the months since I really have found my mind kept, keeps going back to the Camino and to Spain and recognizing how much I did really get out of it and how possible it is to go on your own. And, you know, you're going to meet a lot of people. You're going to have a lot of experiences and maybe it won't be exactly what you think, but it's going to be incredible. And it was. Well, well said, well said. I'd say that was fantastic for you to share that with us. And somebody might be watching and saying, hmm, I think I'm going to pray about that or I've been on it too. And I know what it's like. So thank you so much for coming on today and sharing with us today, Maria. That's Thanks. fantastic. Now we'll transition over to Father and my honey. All right. Okay, great. All right, so here we are. We're going to live in the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we actually have a really cool moment. So here you go. All right. Yeah, we got something for it's you. All news so to me. This was, it is news. So we got a presentation from you for you from for friends in Toronto. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So here we are living in the moment. Thank you, Anne, yes, for you. Uh, really designing all of this. This yes. is really super special. And wow. Janelle for actually sponsoring our pair. She was one of the ones who came up to the Cape uh, with us. Okay. Pilgrimage. And she's actually pilgrimage. Yeah. And uh, she, she, donated. she donated this for our parish. And here you were yesterday talking about the saints and the blesseds and everything. So, oh, for Canadian. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. So. Wow, spectacular. Holy something? Saints of Canada, pray, pray for, for us. us. <laughs> <laughs> so so you'll, you'll have to figure a out a, a, a place for that. Absolutely. Isn't that well, okay. special? Sure. So I had a uh, I had a thought that maybe you hadn't watched the Father Roger show because uh, he he was blessed with one as well and he was quite touched. He was already trying to figure out where it was going to go. So, anyways, no, I hadn't uh, watched it. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. That's okay. <laughs> you're, you're 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 busy. Homework. So let, let's talk about the saints and the blessed. I mean, what a what a treasury we have here. Absolutely. In, in our in our country. Do you have any thoughts? You know, just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I, I know that a lot of the parishes across the country more and more are starting to uh, discover or rediscover, maybe the best way to put it, right. uh, the Canadian saints. Mm -hmm. And in our, our Canadian calendar, of course, when the Roman Missal changed uh, in 2009, all the, the, the language changed, of course, uh, we started entering in new, con new texts for saints that are particular to our country for the Canadian version of the New Roman Missal. Of course, that's a living document. It's constantly changing. Uh, the new things being added into it and so on and so forth as uh, saints that are uh, from this country right. are elevated to the honors of the altar. And as other ones come along and awaiting ones, for example, uh, Father Michael McGivney, the Knights of Columbus. Right. Of course, uh, still a venerable servant of God. But uh, good Lord willing, he'll be beatified and then eventually canonized. Uh, it's just one example. I mean, it's, I'm looking across the way, I see Fulton J. Sheen. Right. Uh, here in Canada, we have... Uh, uh, How about Blessed the, Frederick? Blessed Frederick, <laughs> yes, of course. And uh, the former uh, Governor General, who, uh, who was interred with his wife at the Citadel in Quebec City. Mm. And there's a nice little chapel place you can go pray for them. And there's a cause for their sainthood for the example of uh, married life. Right. Uh, um, I'm just finding their name escapes me uh, right now. I, can't I wonder if they're on the, on uh, the board. They're not on there because they're not, they're not venerable. They're not even beatified. They're not beatified. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so any, any that you recognize that you can. Anyone I recognize? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, not from, uh, well, there's a lot of them on there that I'm right, familiar with. Um, well, St. Andre Bassett is yeah, right here, yeah, actually. Of course, he's this there. We have great. the door to him, uh, yeah. have the statues of him in the parish. Uh, Marguerite Bourgeois of the military chapel in Winnipeg. It's named after her. Of course, in the hymnal, we have uh, a hymn uh, for January 12th that we sing on that day. Right. Uh, it's about her and honor, honoring her. Um, St. Marguerite Duville, of course, mother of the colony. St. Francois de Laval, who's interred in Quebec City, um, or Montreal, rather. Right. Um, so 
you know, it's just these amazing. are all the blesseds up all, here. All the blesseds that are up there. Do you know any Soon of the blessings? Yeah. Um, I'm going to have a quick look here. Uh, I've heard about uh, Saint Louis de Maria Maria de Turgeon, um, Saint Marie Blondin, of course. You've heard about. I'm trying to look at some of the other ones here. We have Off the top of my head, Marie Leone Paradis. Oh yes, yeah. that's right. Yes, we have that one as well. Yeah. So, so the that, more to come. Yeah, more to come. And these are the Canadian martyrs. Canadian of martyrs, course. North American martyrs. Yeah, yeah. as the yeah. states call them. Who they celebrate their feast day in Canada different than we do in the states. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 And I think, and I think it's one thing that's important in understanding about all these men and women and the people today uh, and ourselves. Right. First and foremost. They're all human beings, right? And uh, every one of them uh, exercised the option in their life, their option for the Lord. That doesn't mean that it was an easy journey. It doesn't mean that they didn't have sins in their life or anything like that. Uh, we all have sins, right? We're all uh, capable of sinning. And you know, Bishop uh, Barron said, "Well, the best thing about the Catholic Church is that it was made for sinners, right? So, regardless <laughs> of, uh, of who you are or where you what you." done in your life, the, the gift of salvation is always there. And the option for uh, sanctity in, in this life is there too. Right. Right? The saints are who? They're the friends of God. Right. And St. Paul, even in the letters that he writes to the various communities that he uh, visited, he refers to them oftentimes as saints mm. because they're people who have fallen in love with God. And, and that's what we are called to do. It's not simply someone who lived an uber pure life. Right. And you look at some of the great saints of the church, St. Augustine, for example, didn't start off so smooth. You right. know, he was a pretty uh, rough and tumble kind of guy, yeah. uh, lived life uh, to the fullest, shall we say. Yes. And his mother, Monica, prayed for him for you know, decades for his conversion. Finally, that happened. Right? And he went yeah. on to become a, a bishop and doctor of the church. So... That hope is there for all of us. You know, we all we have to do is exercise it. And it's a struggle. It's more and more in the world in which we live, we're faced with greater temptations. And and it, because it manifests themselves in so many different ways. Mm. And Satan is going to do everything he can right. to distract us, to sidebar us, to do everything he can uh, to pull us down. And when those temptations come, that's when we have to fight all the, all the more. But we shouldn't never think about fighting alone. It's important to have friends and companions that share our faith that we can interact with, uh, have a good priest confessor you can go to, right. uh, you can talk to, have a spiritual director mm. uh, to assist us when those times come. And never give up hope. Never think that God has ever rejected you. Never think that God thinks that we're a, a waste of time and energy mm. because God doesn't work that way. God created us himself and he created us for greatness. All we have to do is to seek to pursue it. And it's not unavailable. There's a double negative right. that for any of us, right? It's available for all, all of, us. of us. So even though you might think that you know, you're not worthy, I said, stop that right now. <laughs> right? We're all worthy. And uh, we have to you know, convince ourselves that sometimes more so than anybody else. And I think oftentimes that's one thing that... Um, pains our Lord, pains our Blessed Mother, is when we convince ourselves that we're junk. Mm. God doesn't create junk. Right. God creates saints. Right. And we have a lot of them in Canada, and a lot of us who can kind of come from other countries have a whole list of saints that you might know from the old country, as the saying goes, right? right? Continue to pray for their intercession. You know, pray for the Canadian saints if you have a devotion to them in one way, shape, or form. Pray for one another because we're all saints in the making, right? yeah. hopefully. Yeah. You know? Fabulous. So, Thank you, Father. No so worries. we'll we'll ask Angelina, our guest, to come up, and we're going to close in prayer. And I think Angelina has uh, – what are we doing? We're doing the Novena prayers that we're doing? Okay, so follow the script, Father. Of the Queen of the Holy Rosary. Come, um, ladies, yes. Come on over. Thank you. Yeah, we'll lift this up, too. Just yeah. one Last page. With us. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So, all right. So, my dear brothers and sisters, wherever you may find yourself at this point, as we draw a close to our show this day, let us mark ourselves yet again with the sign of our faith, Father, Son, Holy yes. Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we pray, O Holy Virgin Mary, our most merciful Mother, we, your children, humbly prostrate before you, implore your grace and help. 
With confidence we come to you, O Queen of the Holy Rosary. To you do we turn our eyes. Bestow on us, we beg you, the special favor that we ask, that we may all truly become saints of God. Grant us health of body and purity of soul. Increase our faith and love so that we may know your divine Son better and serve him ever faithfully. O tender and merciful Mother, intercede for those who are dear to us. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, and have pity on the faithful departed. Protect our families, guard our country, and keep Holy Mother Church safe from all evil. Our Lady of the Cape, may we love you more and more, so that one day, united with you in heaven, we may praise your Son eternally. Amen. And whatever language in which you speak best, you wish to share at this time, let us pray. Hail Mary, full, full of, of grace, grace the Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst women, and, and blessed, blessed is the fruit, fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, pray for us. Our Lady of the Cape, pray for us. The Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth proclaiming the gospel by our lives. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Hey. All right, thanks Thank for joining us. We'll see you next week. God Have bless you. Have a good day. God bless you, God.